joins me now. Professor Hanke, thanks for uh, joining us on the, the mother of all talk shows. We'll come to the currency issue in a minute, but I wonder if you would care to reprise in uh, succinct form uh, what it is you think is going to happen in fuel poverty terms as a result of a whole range of things, but including uh, the cutting off of Russian oil and gas. Well, thank you for having me, George. Let, let me, if I may, correct your attribution for me. I'm a professor of applied economics at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and I'm actually speaking to you from Baltimore. I'm not from Cambridge. <laughs> in any case. Uh, My apologies. It, My it, apologies. Johns Hopkins is even just as distinguished. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Uh, in any case, <laughs> to this first question, uh, what you have with sanctions and the history of sanctions, that sanctions are ineffective, immoral, but unfortunately politically convenient. And the sanctions that have been put on Russia will affect, obviously, the oil and gas markets. Uh, and, and, and they will affect them in ways that are really unintended kind of negative consequences associated with sanctions. This always goes along with sanctions, George. They're ineffective in the sense that they do not change the behavior uh, of the targeted enemy. They don't win wars and they don't change regimes uh, of those targeted enemies. In fact, what they usually do is entrench the enemy because they stimulate what's called a rally around the flag effect. You, you actually circle the wagons. Once, once, you real, once the population realizes that their leader or their regime is being sanctioned, they, they know they're the enemy they're being fired at, so they, they tend to kind of circle the wagons, rally around the flag. But let's talk about the unintended negative consequences. We, we are going to have a, a massive disruption in the international uh, gas and oil market as a result of these sanctions. And that will simply mean, pure and simple, that the price of oil and gas around the world for everybody is going to be higher than it would otherwise be. You know, since the Arab oil embargo in the 19, early 1970s, uh, since that ended, we've essentially had a pretty free flow of oil and gas moving around the world. This is coming to an end. We will have a politicized market. We won't have a free flowing market. Uh, George, let me just give you one. Uh, uh, go back to 1979 for a minute, George. What happened in 1979 that was big? So the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Jimmy Carter was the president of the United States at that time. Uh, Brzezinski was the national security advisor. Brzezinski said, oh, we have to stick it to the Soviets. Of course, Brzezinski couldn't stand the, the Russians or the Soviets. We, we got to stick it to them. And we, the United States, put a ban on the export of grain from the United States to the Soviet Union. Now, what did that do? That, that created what I call the Afghan effect. The Soviets right away went to the Argentina. And, and they cut a deal with the, with the Argentines. They said, we can no longer purchase grain from the United States, so we're going to purchase it from you. They got a good deal from Argentina. So it, they weren't hurt. The, 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 the ban on export of U.S. grain it didn't, didn't hurt the Soviets because they, they got a good substitute at a good price. It, it did lots of damage to American farmers, however, and, and American farmers were the main ones who did not vote for Jimmy Carter when he ran for a second term. So politically, it was a complete disaster for Carter. And in addition to that, it was a huge benefit for who was in power in Argentina, one of our arch enemies, the Junta because they had a terrific economic boom in Argentina. So that's, that's how these sanctions, unintended negative consequences 
always work. And there's a huge literature on this. It's unambiguous. It's very definite. The problem is politicians have no interest and pay absolutely no attention to it. That is understandable. Politicians are frequently idiots. We, we can see that uh, on, our, on our screens. But we used to have a fourth estate, uh, the media, whose job it was to scrutinize the actions of politicians, to subject them to analysis by uh, academics and, uh, and uh, analysts like your good self. Uh, and bring that information, counter-information, to the government's own propaganda uh, before the people. None of that is happening now, though, Professor. You and I are having this conversation. By the end of this week, a million people will have watched it, but the other billions of people in the world have no access to this countervailing uh, discussion that you and I are having. That's a big problem, isn't it? Well, it's always been a problem. It's, it's gotten worse. I have always uh, uh, instructed my students to follow and uh, pay attention to what I call my 95% rule. 95% of what you read in the press is either wrong or irrelevant. So that's the starting point. Now, the problem is worse because what they've done in places like the White House, they, they bought huge industrial washing machines with, with big spin cycles in them, and they're spinning. And, and the press is beholden to the spinners. Where, where, where does the press, even the, even the top line press, to get access to the points of power like the White House, they have to behave themselves and they have to repeat what's in the spin cycle. Quite so, uh, although what that has to do with journalism is uh, very difficult to see. But then real journalists uh, like Julian Assange uh, uh, can, uh, can suffer grave uh, consequences. So maybe there's that chilling effect uh, also. Let's uh, go, if we may, uh, to the currency question. It, it is only a hundred days since uh, commentators and politicians in Western countries were dancing on the grave of the ruble, uh, smashed into, into rubble, you might say. Uh, now the ruble is uh, doing quite well, thank you. How did that happen? Well, it, it happened... Uh, it, 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 let me make this one general comment. The, the governor of the, the Central Bank of Russia happens to be a very clever woman and operated very effectively in this crisis. And, and now the ruble, of course, it's stronger against the U.S. dollar than it was before the Russians invaded Ukraine. So it's, it, it's super strong right now. Now, part of the, the and this is due to all, the entire apparatus that they've that they've set up to, shall we say, protect the ruble in a way, and it, it's worked. What what can I say? How many central bank governors? Most of them, most of the central bank governors in the world right now are are running around trying to make excuses for what has caused the huge inflations in the countries that they're in. And, and they refuse to indicate that their mismanagement and printing of too much money is always the cause of inflation. And they, they have caused inflation in all these countries, but they're, they're running around saying everything. I mean, President Biden has even said that Putin is causing the American inflation of all things. It's Putin, the supply chains, COVID, a million things. But what in fact, is causing the inflation in the United States. Too much government spending that started when co the COVID pandemic hit, that started under Trump, by the way, and it, and it was accelerated on steroids with Biden. And who has been financing 
most of the government deficit that was created by that spending. The central bank in the United States, the Federal Reserve, has been monetizing the deficit, creating a, a tremendous growth in the money supply, and bingo, we have the, the highest inflation we've had in 40 years in the United States. You've got the same thing going on in the United Kingdom, as you all know. Now, Icarus flew uh, too close to the sun, and we know what happened to him. Uh, all this uh, printing of uh, fake money uh, by particularly your central bank, but also ours and others, it can only have one effect, can't it? It can only uh, reduce the stability and ultimate value of that uh, currency. Otherwise, economics that I was taught and the economics that you are teaching mean nothing. If we're wrong, then our, econ our economics has all been for naught. It is a truism that uh, too much money chasing too few goods equals inflation. And if you are merely turning the printing press or in digital terms, uh, keeping your finger on the button and letting the zeros uh, multiply uh, can only lead to uh, inflation. And, and therefore, I'm asking you as the expert, what's going to happen to the US economy and the UK economy? What's going to happen to the dollar? Well, uh, first, let's talk about the dollar. This is kind of a, a little bit ironic, George, but the dollar is extremely strong right now. It, it's, it's not as strong as the ruble has been, but it's, it's extremely strong. And that is due to the fact that it is the global international currency. Whether you like it or not, there's always one international currency that dominates. And the U.S. dollar happens to be that currency. And, and once troubles break out any place in the world, whether it be a, a war or economic troubles, any kind of troubles, people go to the safe haven. They go to the global currency. And so they, they have gone to the U.S. dollar and it's gotten very strong. Now, that's, that's, that's the dollar. But you said, well, what's going to happen to the U.S. economy and the U.K. economy? Inflation is baked in the cake. They've produced so much excess money that this, this excess money will still be kind of in the monetary bathtub waiting to overflow and overflowing within the next year or two. So we will see a continued sustained inflation in the United States this year, as well as 2023, no matter what the central bank or the government actually does. And you're going to have the same problem in the United Kingdom. Now, the, the other aspect of that is that the central banks are scared. They want to rein in inflation. And if they overdo things and tighten things up too fast, they will dump us into a recession. So that would be the, the worst of both worlds. We're going to have inflation no matter what. And if they dump us into a recession, then we are going to have what they call stagflation. And by the way, these sanctions, these international sanctions aren't helping that picture at all because the, the high energy prices, by the way, are, are going to ultimately end up tanking Europe without any question. They're, they're going to have very severe, negative, unintended consequences in Europe and, and the Europeans are literally flying blind. If you look at a big industrial power house like Germany, for example, it's very dependent, its industries on power, on energy and fossil fuels. Well, now they've, they've got a, basically the Greens running the show in, in Germany and, and they're gonna find out pretty soon they're, they're just not gonna have power. What, what, what are they what are they going to do they're going to, they're going to have to slow down so they're I think they're in very serious trouble on the continent I do too uh, professor Steve Hanke an, an honor actually to uh, speak with you and to hear you speak thank you very much for joining us from John's 
Hopkins University. 